Good morning. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Living with Favor. I'm Lisa Mosby, your host. I want you to grab your coffee or your tea. Today it's fall and it's warm out and I have my uh, my lemon tea. I don't know where you're seeing it, but I have my cup of cup of lemon tea in my, in my background here. So grab your coffee. You know, today we're going to delve into the heart of generosity and its impact. And today's topic is called Live More and give more. So I invited my dear friend, Leanne Lyon here. You have all seen her before. Uh, she's my friend and she's my business partner. She uh, She's a black belt in karate. That's what I'm going to leave you with. So don't mess around. This lady knows her stuff and, uh, and she has the heart of gold. She has generosity to fill a stadium. And I couldn't think of a better person to have this conversation with. It showed up in my uh, executive meetings this week in my executive networking group that happens from seven to 8 a.m. Central Time, we were talking about giving and and I just didn't get enough of it. And I called Leanne and was like, I want to talk to you. I want you to bring all of your uh, your thoughts, your books, your ideas, your scriptures. Let's dive into this conversation. So Leanne also has a show on Win 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 Women TV, and it's called Lead with Leanne. So please check her out over there. In the meantime, welcome, my dear. I'm so glad you're with me this morning. I love spending time with you. You know that. <laughs> We have mutual fan clubs, um, you know, when you when you have friends in your life who you just adore and you can't imagine your life without them, that's where you are. <laughs> well, thank you. And the same. I've been trying to put together a reel on Facebook and Facebook keeps like timing out every time I do it and where I'm putting in pictures of, of blessings. And when I say blessings, people who are blessings in my life and you're right in there, like right towards the beginning. But yeah, yeah I just can't get the reel to go through and I don't know what the, <laughs> what the deal is. So I'm like, okay, mm. well, I'm not meant to publish it today. I'll do it another day. It's all good. Yeah. That's interesting. When it happens, you can't, sometimes you wonder things show up for a reason. Yeah. Maybe there's a new addition that needs to go in that reel. Who knows? Maybe. I'm sure God has a plan for it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I do. Uh, I'm trying to think of where we should start with this. Do you want to share a personal story of giving significance that kind of impacted your life? I know you have so many of them, and maybe that will uh, launch us into our conversation. Yeah, there's a couple of things, um, and I'll, I'll give a really recent story. And that was, yeah, I've been, I've been, I was raised a Christian. I grew up in the Lutheran Church, and. I always gave my little offering, and when I had, when we had children, you know, we would give them an allowance and we'd teach them to tithe. But I don't know that we were fully tithers ourselves, and so I started praying over this, and I was like, you know, we should. And one day, my husband turned to me, he says, "What do you think about tithing?" I'm like, "Yes," you know, and I'd been praying about it for months. And then, um, but, you know, times get crazy or expenses come up, and sometimes it's the first thing you kind of put off to the side. And then I launched a new business and, you know, I was like, oh, you should be tithing. I should be tithing. And, and I just kept resisting it. And then I was reading a book. I had an, I have an advanced copy of an amazing book coming out. <laughs> um, and in the book, she says, I had to die to selfishness, being offended, self-comparison and my weaknesses. And it just hit me like, and tithing, like I had to die to not tithing and as and it was actually in her same bible study she leads a bible study on wednesday mornings 10 a.m central and we're focused on this book 30 life principles and the third uh we're on which chapter um the 23rd chapter is called um you can never out give god and the reminder that we're only giving back a portion of what he's actually provided us in the first place. And right there, I was like, done. I'm done. I'm done with the sin, which is really how I see it. And I'm like, oh, I am completely relieved of this kind of underlying, just knowing I should be doing something different. I've had those aha moments a lot lately, by the way. And, um, and, and just what a freedom it actually feels. So now when income comes into my business, I just boom, boom, shoot 10% back out and I forget about it. And it's so easy yeah. to do with phones and apps. I mean, it just boom, it lands, boom, it goes and I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And even churches have it set up. So if you, if you do receive your salary as, um, an automatic deposit into your account, it can come in and it can go right back out, you know, 
um, you can set it up with an electronic funds transfer. I know my church does that. So um, yeah, so you if can you have know you're set... going to get paid on certain days, right? Yeah, out on certain days as well. Mine is yeah. not that. No, we're both commissioned, <laughs> so there's no consistency. And yeah. I know they say you need to be consistent. It's like, but when the money comes in, it's the consistency is the act of tithing. But the day may change based on when we get paid. Yeah. Or if I get paid 10 times in a month and I just tithe 10 times in a month, it, it costs me 30 cents um, to, to do it. And it doesn't even cost, the church will pay the 30 cents. Hmm. I think I can do that too. <laughs> you know, but there's no additional expense to the, to the number of times that I send money through this, through this method. So, so yeah. that's one story. But I have others. When we, th <laughs> when we think of giving a lot of time, you went straight to tithing? But giving is so much more than that. So oh, yeah. I think depending on the person that we were talking to, giving will show up differently. Like everyone will answer that question differently. Perhaps they receive something. And so they identify their experience of receiving and can and can describe what it felt like when someone gave to them. Um, perhaps it would be, you know, that you were, for in my case, I was raised with giving. You volunteer your time. I started, we we started when we were five, six, seven years old. I was in karate, like you, um, and, and the owner of our dojo has... Uh, has a child with muscular dystrophy, had, still has a child with muscular dystrophy, and they would do fundraisers for muscular dy dystrophy. And this is when Jerry Lewis did a telethon on Labor Day for, um, they were it was called Jerry's Kids, and it was a 24-hour telethon to raise awareness and funds for muscular dystrophy. And at the Minnesota, this is pairing my love for the Minnesota State Fair that I've worked at 21 years. Um, we would go to the Minnesota State Fair and do these expos in the education building. We were on stage and we would do demonstrations and forms. And we were the only kids in karate at that time. This was 40 plus years ago. Not a lot of kids were in karate at that time. And so we, I, I called it my dancing monkey years where I would get up and entertain people with these activities. And then they had a booth outside and they had a huge fishbowl that my little brother could fit in and people would throw money into that when we did things. So I was jumping over stuff and breaking boards with my feet and punching boards. And, you know, the, the adults were doing things as well. But this is this is how I've linked up giving. We give of our time and then we raise money and we give to organizations for charities. We give to support people when they're going through times of yep. challenge, you know. I, I think for me, what I, what comes to mind is like how I felt about being able to do that. Like when you tithe to your church, you light up. When you talk about tithing, it's like you are experiencing something within your own self through that giving process. And I remember yeah. that through that time. And then I've done a tremendous amount of volunteer work and started a couple of community gardens and things. And when people come and they receive that, that produce, that free produce, families that can't afford to pay for that, like you see them light up and it's not about how they feel. It's like how I feel. So there's this two-sided coin when it comes to giving. Have you experienced that? Yeah. And fact, um, I really look at my business the same way. If you look yeah. at, okay, I'm going to work, I'm going to put 40 hours a week into my business. I'm going to tithe four hours of that. And so when you're looking at a business development, you know, you need to, you need to allocate, you need to have some time dedicated to working on your business, some time dedicated to working in your business. You have to do marketing, you have to deal with the finances, there's all this stuff, but I also looked at how can I just generously give of my time, you know, up, up to four hours a week. And part of that is I do two, two hours of Q&A calls where literally anybody can come in and just ask me any question. And I just pour into, you know, what I know and how I can help. And I have a couple of other calls where I do similar things, but on a more focused level. And I don't charge for those hours. You know, there's no, there's no fee. There's no mem monthly membership or anything. People tell me I could, they're probably right, but then it wouldn't be generously giving. But I have another thought about giving. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, yeah. Too much. Um. Sometimes, and this came up actually on my show just yesterday. Um, sometimes we are so like, oh, I'll just give it to you. I'll just give it to you. So, um, and that's a common thing. Now, my guest yesterday, who started her business in 1984, so it's a fascinating conversation. Uh, she said that for years, she was helping her friends 
to write speeches and write acceptance speeches and write these different things. And she would, she would just meet with them, talk with them, get the voice right, get the stories right, really craft these things. And then one day a friend who has pl had plenty of money said, you know, I would pay you for this. She hadn't been charging for it. And she's like, no, I just thought this is what I did for my friends. And that was her aha moment to say, you know what? We deserve to be paid, though, for our gifts. We don't have to be. Like, if you think of the, the story of the woman with, um, with the oil in the New, T New Testament, yeah, she, she and her son were down to the, like, their last pennies. And I think Paul or somebody, Peter, told her to go collect all the jars that she had and to start filling them with oil. And so she had this one little jar of oil and she started filling jar after jar after jar. This is a similar story to the, the loaves and fishes story. If you know that one, of course mm -hmm. you do. Um, but the <laughs> oil, you know, she filled every jar she had and then the oil ran out. And then she said, okay, I filled all the jars. He, what do I do now? He said, sell it. He didn't say you got it for free. So go give it. Yeah. He said, sell it. Yeah. Provide, become a provider for your family. Yeah. Become the provider for your family. So just because you receive a gift or a talent, a skill, doesn't mean you should just give it away. Yeah. And you can tithe. You can tithe your time and you can you tithe your gift as well. So, but you do that with that mindset of, you know, there are some people that need a, a hand up or, you know, a leg up, so to speak. And, and you can have scholarships for those people. You can have, you know, time or tithe set aside uh, to yeah. support and, and pour into those people. Everybody needs assistance sometimes, but we also need to get paid for our gifts. You know, is there a more effective way to encourage other people to embrace a giving, a giving mindset? Because I don't know, I want to use an example, but I don't want to offend this person. And if they ever saw this, they would know this. But, but there are some people that it's just take, take, take. It's mine. It's like, um, you know, I worked, I deserve, and there is no give back. Like there, it's just some folks have this accumulation place. And I don't want to pass judgment on anyone. If you're listening to this, if you've not been a giver, if you not, don't tithe, if you, um, you know, if, if it's not a part of your regular day. Maybe you didn't know how. I was raised with it. In fact, I have often, like Leanne said, there can be too much giving. I have been criticized because I give too much. I volunteer too much. And if I just, you know, it's been said to me, if I spend as much time making money as I did volunteering, I'd be rich. And it's like, well, God's a pretty good provider. I've, I've been okay so far. You know, I don't need piles of money and storehouses full of it. I have enough. I have a roof over my head. I have food in my belly. And I can, I can volunteer and I can help people. And the rich that I get in my soul and my heart and who I am is payback enough for that time. But how do we encourage people to experience this, to, to maybe embrace a giving mindset? Thoughts on that, Leanne? Yeah, I'm actually looking up verse. So I kind of figured, I saw your eyes down there. I'm going, oh, she's goes, got a book. <laughs> you know, go back and I'm actually looking up on the in the Bible, actually on my app. Oh, okay. So Philippians 419, which I had to look up, by the way, I'm not that good at this stuff yet but philippians 4 19 um and again if this person isn't a scripture bible believer jesus believer it might be a little harder to say hey listen scripture but um 4 19 says um i have received well 18 actually i've received full payment and have more than enough i am amply supplied now that I've received from, I cannot pronounce this name, <laughs> like a lot of names in the Bible, the gifts you sent, they are in a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the richness, richness, riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. And so it's sometimes I think when people are hanging on so tight, they have a fear that they're, that they, they believe it's, well, first of all, they believe they earned it. They don't see it as a gift. And when you see that everything is a gift, then it's a lot easier to let it go, I think. But, yeah. um, it, you know, this is why scripture is so important. You know, I have a lot of people in my world right now, a lot of people who are like, oh, well, you know, the Bible is just fiction. You know that, right? 
they'll actually tell me this. And I'm like, have you read it? Because the version I'm reading right now, I'm actually walking through the entire thing again. I'm on day 10. Um, and I'm doing it in what's called a chronological order. And the detail, this particular version that I'm doing, um, it actually gives dates. And if you read, like, so I'm, I'm way back in Genesis, like the first book. But it actually gives dates, like, um, here it is. Um, uh, I'm going to not choose that one for my own reasons, but. Here's the devotional. 1728 BC, Joseph, now 17, angers his brothers and almost loses his life. They're putting dates on this. And if you really look at Genesis and a lot in chron Chronicles and Kings, they're very specific. I mean, this isn't just somebody made up these names that I can't pronounce. Yeah. These are actual genealogies that lived on the planet. They're yeah, that lived on, on Earth. Planet. Yeah. And so and they're actually putting dates to these things. And so people are like, oh, Noah, that was a, you know, that was just a no, there's a date on here. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to see it as what it was called to be, actually God's word, actually, yes, people had to write it out, but they were God and divinely inspired. You know, if we hold that that's true. Um, then it, it just changes your perspective on these different things. And, and and people say, well, but there's so much contradiction. And I'm like, well, there were a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. And that's why a you lot of read the book by, uh, uh, called uh, Case for Christ by, I think it's Strobel is the last name. And he's a, a retired uh, police detective. And he was an atheist and set out to prove that the Bible is false. And there's no way that there could be any truth in that. And the exact opposite is what happened. He used his detective skills. And it's it's a great story. I got to see him speak some time ago. I've seen him a couple of times. And uh, the book is called it's a, a Case for Christ. And he actually shows the case from a pers from a detective's perspective on why the Bible is true and and the dates and how they line up and all of those things. So if uh, if you're in that space and you're not sure, or if you have people in your life that you may want to help you know, expose them to the Bible in a different way, that might be a place to start. Have them check out why, you know, as an atheist, he decided to believe that um, that it is true. The other thing yeah. I think sometimes we lose sight of is, have you? do you know what a parable is? I mean, you know what a parable is. You're an avid reader. So a parable is, you know, it, it can be a true story, but we use analogies like the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is like Lake Calhoun here in Minnesota, the former Lake Calhoun. It's it's not like when we think of a, I think of a sea, I've, I've, you know, the Red Sea or the Black Sea. Some of these seas are massive. Um, but the Sea of Galilee is this smaller little lake. And you can see that on some of the 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 uh, the maps and things that it's not it's not ginormous. People can actually walk around it where some seas you wouldn't be able to. So I think in terms of description, then we think that people are lying or there's this made up stuff. And it was just, it's language, it's interpretation from other languages to the English language. So some of those yeah. things get lost in translation or they can be looked at like, it's a parable, it's a description and it's not true. And so that's why we have these scholars who have di who dive into and explain. When you get into a Bible study and you get to look at every word or every sentence, um, the clarity starts to come and you start to have an understanding and you can see the bigger picture. So I think there's lots of reasons why we can call it, you know, untrue and, and that it didn't really happen. But when you actually spend the time and investigate and invest in your soul and your, you know, savior, you'll, you'll learn, you'll know if it's and true or not. If, any, if anybody's like, well, where do I start? It's a big book. It is. Yeah. But start with the, I would start with the gospel of John. It's the fourth gospel. And I only learned recently what gospel means. It's actually a stolen word from the Roman um, language the emperors in, of, of Rome, they, there were gospels of each emperor, which is their birth, their life, their death. That's why it's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, the, all four gospels talk about, at least not all four talk about birth, but, the, you know, over the four life birth. And, the death. and so yeah. all of them are set up that way. That's why they're called gospels. I never knew that before. I didn't know that. The yeah. fourth gospel is, is the gospel of John. Yeah. And... All of them are great. Read all of them eventually. But John is just so 
that was the first one that I was told to read. When I yeah. really said, I really want to start studying the Bible, that's the gospel I was told to read. And in reading it, I was like, this is this is fantastic. And in terms of almost fantasy, ten, fantastic, like yeah. unbelievable fantastic. But if you really see, these were real things that really happened. It's amazing to say, how can anyone doubt that Jesus was the son of God? Because really? nobody else can do the things that he was doing. Even though in the end, he commissions us to go out and do the same and more, which is mind blowing because we've really lost that as well. Um, I want to go back just a moment. There's another book that's out recently and it's specifically about, you know, the science and how science lines up with the Bible and really proving the Bible through science for those people who are like science we need science we need science well science is all theory it's called a hypothesis scientific hype scientific hypothesis yeah and the scientific method scientific mm -hmm. method is all guessing yep yes and check i got yes. in a huge argument with one of my teachers about this it's like this is the truth oh my gosh they kicked me out of my class because i was like you're just mm -hmm. making stuff up and then you're making your you know your like I can make numbers do anything. <laughs> I can steer them any yeah. direction I want to. And that to me was what the scientific method was in my molded, you know, my learning brain. So I get what you're saying. It's like, that's pretty made up too. <laughs> There's a real book. You can find it called How yeah. to Lie with Statistics. Yeah. And, and we're lied to all the time with statistics. There's one other part I wanted to share. You shared the, the story of that uh, gentleman who went out to prove that. So in this, again, book that I is got it's coming out really soon so um but there's one part in here that just even as a believer it floored me um it says that we can learn from those who radicalized their rejection and hatred towards god and the gospel of jesus here are the final words of some famous atheists before their deaths and she has several in here, um, Thomas Paine, David Hume. Um, so Thomas Paine was famous as leading political activist and atheistic writer in the American colonies. David Hume, a Scottish atheist, philosopher, and essayist, famous for his religious skepticism. Sir Francis Newport, politician and head of the English Atheist Club, to those gathered around his deathbed, he said, you need not tell me there is no God, for I know there is one. And I am now in his presence. You need not tell me there is no hell. I feel myself already slipping. Wretches, cease your idle talk with there being hope for me. I know I am lost forever. This is on his deathbed. Uh, I know I am lost forever. Oh, that fire. Oh, the unsufferable pangs of hell. It goes on. I mean, this is what they saw. Charles the Ninth, French king, urged by his mother, he gave the orders for the massacre. He had a similar thing. Anton Levy, American author, musician, and Satanist, who wrote the Satanic Bible and became the high priest of the Satanic worship. And I'll end with this one. His dying words were, oh my, oh my, what have I done? There is something very wrong. so i'm like oh you know i i've never heard those things before but you yeah. you know but it's taught it's biblical that that is real and these people who rejected it all their lives discovered it as they slipped into it forever forever that's a mighty long time and i'm here to tell you oh wait, i'm from minnesota <laughs> <laughs> that's yes, prince that's prince, prince. <laughs> I, was, I was quoting prince suddenly whoops but yeah yeah, yeah. let's pull it back into uh to giving so yeah, how does this uh, how does this how does this align with uh giving more and living more yeah i just think you know giving is part of what we're called to do and again i believe when you're talking about your your person um you know start with something small and just say you know what maybe let's do a project let them experience the joy of giving if mm -hmm. it's at all possible bring them into a 
Feed My Starving Children event, which is fun. They got music, you're doing something, it's social, you know, find a way to, to, you know, let people experience it and don't just bring them in and then let it go. Find a way to bring it back to saying, how did you feel while you were there? You know, did you yeah. notice a lightness of heart? Did you notice a, a joy, if you will? Um, every day right now, I'm putting little um, videos on my stories. And this whole week, I'm specifically picking, picking songs that have the word joy in them. Every single day, I'm using a word that's joy. So I'm excited to do it. I'm getting better and better at my stories on Facebook. Yeah. Um, I haven't done it yet. I will do it. I'm going to learn it. I'm, I'm diving yeah. into it. Um, yeah, how does this affect communities? When, when you said, uh, take them to feed my starving children, um, my nephew, Dominic, for one of his birthdays, he was pretty young, yeah, maybe preteen, and was like, what do you want to do for your birthday? And he, I don't know if he'd seen pictures of me doing it where we I had gone with a church group or different groups where we were packaging up food that was going to be delivered. And he said he wanted to go right here in Bloomington, Minnesota to um, it, it's the Feed My Starving Children place where, where we're bundling up and packaging up food for his birthday. And we brought friends with, and I don't know how many of us went there. You know, there was a handful of us that went and did that. And it was so amazing. You know, when we introduce this to kids, I love that idea of taking them to have that experience or how I got to have that experience of making contributions to muscular dystrophy and seeing the big check after they counted the money and, it, you know, being on TV and it getting donated and how happy people were like, it affects us. We get to feel good when we do that. But how do we take those acts of generosity and and transform our communities? Uh, I, I see that in the community garden here, I'm not far from, from one of them that I worked at in uh, River Falls, Wisconsin. Um, the people that work there, they show up because they know that food gets donated to the food shelf. And some of the, the folks that receive it come out there and work and volunteer. And they're so grateful. Um we can actually transform communities by involving folks in, you know, contributing and volunteering within their communities, giving back to their communities. But how do we get started? Like what, what creates the mindset? What causes people to take this action? And you can speak from, from kind of your experience on how you get involved and why you do it, how it makes you feel. Um, I think it starts with invitation. And likewise, one of our daughters, at least one, probably both had a Feed My Starving Children birthday too. And they well, make yeah. it special for kids. And I, I, I do think inviting is a thing you know you invite people to you know have a cup of coffee you invite yeah. people to have a conversation invite people to do something with you where there is a giving part of it um but i also think you know inviting children is so brilliant um mm -hmm. in the last month or so um my husband and i have been blessed that a little neighbor girl who has helped me i broke several bones in my body this fall yay um, and she was coming over every day to water the plants because it was difficult for me to do it. And so she started watering the plants. Turns out she loves watering the plants. She's like, I don't know what I'm going to do this fall when I don't have plants to water. I'm like, well, you can come in and water. <laughs> I'll try to keep some plants alive in the house for a change. Come on in and water those. And But one day, just spontaneously, I said, hey, we're going to Bible study. You know, they have a kids program. Would you want to go? And I'd already talked to her mom about this before I just did this. But And her mom was like, yeah, I don't care if they go. I just, I just don't have the energy or desire to go. And I said, that's great. So we invited her, and she loves it. Um, and so, the, you know, the second time I took her, um, she had found some coins in my car. And she, you know, found them, collected them, organized them. And then she handed them to me and I put them in my pocket. And then when we walked in, I said, you know, all those coins you collected, do you know what an offering is? Of course she didn't. No. And so I said, here's the first offering you can give. And so, and she was so excited to be able to give that offering. So, um, and, um, and uh, you know, children can lead their whole families back to church. It happened in my family. You know, my yeah. daughter, when I, when I did lose, um, my focus for a couple of years, it was my daughter who said, mom, will you go to church with me? And it, it changed my life. A year yeah. later I was water baptized. So invite people to do things. It doesn't have to be church. It can be go, go to an event, go to a, a, you know, there's so many things out there. I mean, the, people are doing fundraisers all the time for somebody who's been in a car accident. Go to the car accident, donate some money, um, or do, or donate your time. Do a, mm -hmm. I don't know, there's so many things I can think of. And best of all, 
get to know the person, know what touches their heart and invite them to do something that's a match, you know, and you just have to look for, and well, and I would say, pray about it. If you're the specific person you're looking to, to soften this direction, pray, you know, say, Hey, show me what will attract them. Show me what they will say yes to. But then again, I, I believe you need to follow it up with, how did that feel? How did you like doing that? You know, could you, and I don't care. Volunteer at an art museum. Volunteer. There's so many volunteer opportunities. You know, in Florida right now, after the hur Hurricane Milton, oh. uh, there's like people volunteer, just going cleaning trees off people's yards and helping people take care of and fix up things that are broken around their house. There's like, there's always plenty of opportunities. And it's interesting during times of, um, trauma during times of need, you know, when we have uh, weather and things like that, mm -hmm. that cause so much destruction, people come out and we pass political lines, we pass religious lines, we pass all of these things to the side and we just become human and we serve where it needs to be served. Why can't we be that way every day? Why does there have to be this riff and, you know, uh, Republicans and Democrats, it's like we are human and there is something foundational that all of us need, food, shelter, love, compassion. Uh, you know, it, it'd be nice if on a daily basis we could look past all of those things that divide us and come together as humanity and mm -hmm. give. Um, last thing, I know we're we're getting close to our time here, but I want to talk about giver, giving and receiving and taking, like givers, takers, and receivers. To me, you know, it's giving and receiving is what we often hear, but I throw that word taker in because I think it's a completely different energy than receiving. When we give, there's this expectation of receiving, or maybe um, you don't receive from that person, but when we give, we put into the world, they say, be, my dad always said, be careful what you put into the world because it'll come back to you tenfold. So if you, if you sow you know, nastiness, you're going to get 10 times the nastiness coming back at you. If you sow love and kindness, if you water that, that's what's going to create fruit. That's what's going to come back into your life. And then there's this piece out here that's just, I call it the taker. And we might need to identify those folks because we do want to give. I want to give, I want to support, but there are people that just keep taking, 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 and they don't really fall into the giver or the receiver. It's a, it's um, they, they're coming from a different place. So do you want to chime in on this? Have you had some experience in, in this realm? Don't we all? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but as you were saying that, and I was, you know, hearing what you're saying and just for me trying to listen to what to say about it. <clears throat> takers are sowing an energy. And they, and they will receive back tenfold that energy. So, you know, I think the takers, that they're seeding that, they're seeding poverty and they'll, they'll receive poverty. It may be not financial poverty, but other sorts. Like you said, what we give, just because we tithe, say, money, doesn't mean we get it back in money. And, you know, You've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul, right? So it doesn't need to come back that way. Um, although we are promised to be provided for. Even the sparrows are provided for. One of my favorite songs by jo John Gray, I think his name. And, uh, you know, even the sparrows are taken care of. So we should never have to worry about being taken care of if we're obedient to what we're called to do. But takers aren't obedient. Because we're not called to do that. So they are sowing that lack. And they will receive tenfold lack. And maybe they're receiving back, you know, they're, they're not giving in one way, but they're receiving lack tenfold in other ways. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And we don't give with the expectation of receiving. It's, it's what happens. We know that when we sow, we get to harvest. We, you know, when we knock, uh, the door will be answered. And so when we give, there's a 
a receiving that will happen. And it's equally as important to be a gracious receiver as it is to be a gracious giver. Because the person that is giving to you, um, if you receive and you're a gracious receiver, they will feel good about what they did. And then it's okay to receive. But there, it, it really is an ebb and flow that we can't always just be sucking the world dry. Um, and it's not all about us. It's about a little bit about us and how we feel, but it's also about how other people feel when they give and when they receive. So it's a beautiful yeah, we thing. Were, we were blessed by some people coming out to help us again um, with, with my foot being broken. Like there's things I still can't do. I'm still not supposed to lift because of broken ribs. Um, so this little girl coming over though and, and watering the plants and I thought, oh, I should pay her for it. And then I thought, you know what? It's okay for her to learn to just serve. And I yeah. didn't, but towards the end of the summer, there was a garage sale on the street. And I said, did you go to the garage sale? She goes, yeah. And I said, did you get anything? She goes, no, I don't have any money. So I quick texted her mom and I said, you know, is it okay with you if I go? So we went there and she showed me three or four things that she wanted, but I looked for the light on her face. And the one thing that could be kind of a, an anchor for her, something that she would see and remember, she received this thing that she wanted. Um, not because she gave, you know, of her time and the watering, because she continues to do that for free, but just as a thank you from me to her as well. So it wasn't a payment, but it yeah. was an appreciation. So it was a tangible appreciation that I could give to her. Um, yeah. And it was a stuffed animal. It was cute. Yeah. You know, Aww. she's nine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so, beautiful. So it does come back. Yeah. Come back. Yeah. And I was there when she was watering uh, earlier this week and she, she just lights up like she's running around and getting the water and yeah. doing the plants. And yeah, she was, she was just having such a great time. Like she was being filled up. Her cup was being filled by being able to do that for you. And you could see it because she was just glowing about it's time for me to water the plants. <laughs> and now her older sibling reached, you know, she was there. We had an, a, we had a bonfire and uh, came over, whatever, but she lost something. She lost a, her headset and she was texting me at night. She's like, I can't find it. And I'm like, you're welcome to come over, bring a flashlight. And she goes, okay, thank you. Wasn't there. So I started, I started brainstorming, like, where else did she, I, like, how do I know where a 15 year old left her headset? Right. And, but I'm brainstorming. I'm like, well, did you check here? Did you check there? And, you know, I gave her some ideas that she couldn't check on that night, but she checked the next day, found them. And oh. again, I received a thank you text, which just goes to really good parenting too, by the way. And, um, but it, it brought joy to me that I was able to help her, you know? Yeah. So just look for the joy, you know, there's yeah. so much joy to be found when we can help others. There is. Well, we're at the end of our time, darling. Where can people find you? I know it, I announced your show at the beginning, Lead with Leanne here on winwinwomen.tv, but where else can people find you? How would you like people to get in touch with you if they want to continue this conversation with you? The easiest way is probably through my own website. My first name is spelled L-E-A-N-N. -N. My last name only has four letters. It's L-Y is in yellow, O-N. So LeanneLion.com. Very easy. And from there, though, you can find me on social media. I'm on Facebook quite a few ways. YouTube, I have a YouTube channel celebrating. I have doubled my subscribers in the past month. Yay. And, oh, you know, I do a lot of content over there, um, you know, just branching out. So oh, thank it. you so much for joining me once again. All right, folks, that's a wrap. My name is Lisa Mosby. I'm the host here at Living With Favor, and you can find me at lisamosby.com, and that's Lisa, M-O-S-B-E-Y.com. There you can book 15, or I think I have it up to a 30-minute call because we can't. I can't even talk to you in 15 minutes. So book a 30-minute call. Let's talk about your social media. If you are an entrepreneur and you would like to improve your message, use a little bit of AI-assisted posting in your social media, uh, I'm here to help, for you, help you with that. Please reach out, and, uh, and we'll talk about Take a look at what it is you're doing and how we can improve it or enhance it. All right. Have a great week and we'll see you next week. Come on back, everybody.